Well, good morning everyone. We're going to go ahead and start this worship service. So uh, if you know the words, please feel free to join in along with us. If not, please allow this time to, to center yourself and be in an attitude of meditation and allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and center you in this time of worship. Have a meal. It's a great time. 
It's a great time to be together and to celebrate the love of Christ. Now I'd like to ask Patterson to share our opening prayer with us, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for, for everything that you do for us. Uh, as we sang in the last song, we just want to see you, Lord. We want to be closer to you. We want to, we want to um, gain that extra step to, to be able to spend eternity with you, Lord. And as we struggle and as we, we continuously fail, Lord, we know that you're always there to pick us back up. So in this worship service, we, we thank you for, for the wonderful gifts that you give us and the, the, the eternal forgiveness and the eternal love that you, that you always show us, Lord. And I pray in this worship service, you just open our hearts and our minds to you so that we can receive you to the fullest. May us all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to our next song. Thank you.
are gathered in his name, he will be here. And so we welcome him. We welcome you, those who are here with us in person and those who are joining us uh, online, on a screen somewhere. I'm going to turn to scripture right now. We're looking at Matthew 11. And um, I, I'd like to uh, knock the dust off of our pew pew Bibles that we have here. If you pull one out and, and it's covered in dust, let's, let's knock that dust off. Uh, during this uh, sermon series, and, and maybe we'll do more so, um, I'm asking the congregation to read the scripture with me. And so, if we are all looking at the same version of the Bible, in this case the NIV, we can all read the same words. Why is this important? Well, it's important because uh, every, each and every person needs to have that relationship with, not only with God, but also with scripture. You have to see it for your own self, for your eyes, for your, with your very own eyes. There we go. So, we are looking at uh, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Uh, if you need a little help with that, you will find that scripture on or about page 1019 in the Pew Bibles. Oh, I'm pretty sure we all can find Matthew pretty well. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and read that together. Again, it's Matthew 11, uh, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen. It's great to hear your voices out there reading right along with me. Our message today is, is part of the sermon. My goodness. <laughs> you guys have a spotlight that's just <laughs> coming down on you. <laughs> Y'all can't see that from where you are, but trust me, it was pretty cool. Um, okay, uh, so the scripture, I'm sorry, the, the message is leaving our burdens. And of course, uh, we're still in the sermon series, Prayer Changes Everything. So we're going to be talking about prayer. We're going to be talking about how we can leave our burdens there with God. Before we begin the message, though, let's have a moment of prayer. Please pray with me. Gracious Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, this blessing that you give me every week to bring the message before your beloved people. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are pleasing in your sight. For you alone are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I'm going to start the message with a little story. I invite you just to kind of relax and, and uh, kind of let your imagination go with this story. The story is called The Trouble Tree. Once a year, the people of the village would go to the Trouble Tree. The Trouble Tree was strong and thick at the trunk, and it had generous branches that reached high and wide. It offered shade and beauty with its abundant leaves. Songbirds made their homes in the many branches. When people from the village, throngs of people, arrived at the trouble tree, they would remove their troubles and they would hang them on the tree branches. And when they had unburdened themselves of their worries, they would play, and they would romp about, and it became quite a party. Invariably, musicians would show up, and they would play lively music, and people would dance. Friends would gather and share a picnic lunch. People fell in love. Friendships were forged. Peace and joy ruled the day. However, however, the people watched with great sadness as the sun passed its apex and began to descend down to the horizon. As the shadows became long and as the evening chill arose, people's faces fell because soon the festivities would end. When the picnics were packed away and the musicians were silent and 
the last ray of golden sun passed behind the tree line. The celebration was over. With great reluctance, people took back their troubles. With shoulders stooped and heavy feet, they trudged back home once again, weighed down by their burdens. This is a fun little story. It kind of reads like a fairy tale, doesn't it? Can, can you just imagine all of that? But it does speak to us today. It's not just a fairy tale, because it speaks to us in the way that we lay our burdens at the cross of Christ, and then we snatch them up, right? And they occupy our minds and our hearts again. God clearly tells us to leave our burdens with him. And those that we cannot leave with him, we know that he will help us to carry. We're never alone. We never have to do life alone. Now, it's important for us to understand how the people, uh, his original audience, would have heard this letter. See, the original audience would have been Jewish, and, and they, they lived at the time in an occupied city. And every day, every day, they walked a tightrope, a thin, thin tightrope, between the weight of their Jewish laws and traditions and the cruelty of their Roman oppressors. Let's talk about some of the Jewish laws first. Jewish people were expected to follow the Mosaic law to the letter of the law. And I'll tell you what, those laws were cumbersome. They were heavy, especially for the poorest people. The laws were extremely burdensome to follow. From not working on the Sabbath, I mean, you ever know a poor farmer who didn't work on the Sabbath? Right? And, and uh, they could only walk so far on the Sabbath. In fact, there's a story where, where people would, uh, and I think three quarters was the limit. That's called a Sabbath day's walk, three quarters of a mile. That's it. But if people needed to walk more than that, they would carry a chair with them. And when they had walked three quarters of a mile, they would set the chair down and they would rest for a little bit. And then they would pick up their chair and continue their journey. That sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? But that's, that's what some folks did. Um, they were required to travel to religious services, sometimes many miles, and then they had to either uh, pay for uh, uh, something to sacrifice or bring a piece, uh, uh, one of their um, what, uh, livestock uh, to, uh, to sacrifice that. Then they had those kosher food laws, which required even the poorest of the poor to have two sets of dishes, couldn't mix foods, couldn't store certain foods together. I mean, there was just a lot of rules. Oh, and then there's the ritual hand washing which had nothing to do with germs as we understand it today. It was just a ritual that they had to go through. Well, sometimes the poor farm folks, they just didn't have that kind of fresh water on hand. And what made it so hard for these people is that they're standing in the faith community and their chance for salvation was based on how many laws they could obey or not. So there was a lot riding on following those laws. And of course, the wealthy people, as they always do, they found it easier to follow the letter of the law because they had servants to help them. They had people, somebody not them who could start a fire, somebody not them who could run an errand, right? So they didn't have to worry as much. The ease with which they were able to follow the letter of the law uh, made them smug. They thought they were better than other people because they were better at following the laws. The poor people found it impossible to follow all the laws. And they felt like they were failures, not, as only, not only as Jewish believers, but as human beings. So you can see that they, 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 they had heavy religious burdens placed on them. Let's talk about the Roman taxes next. The Roman officials levied very heavy taxes, tax burdens on them as well. The taxes they collected were exorbitant and they were not standardized. If a Roman official saw somebody who looked like they were really dressed up really nice and figured they had money, they could tax them just for walking down the street. If somebody was carrying home, say, uh, an object that they had just purchased, well, the Roman could... Uh, could levy a tax on that, whatever, whatever the traffic would bear. And, and of course, if they disagreed, 
if they disobeyed with this Roman person, this guard or official or whatever it was, they, they would suffer a beating or perhaps worse. So they had no recourse than to comply. The people were weary. They were worn out. They were tapped out. They were burnt out. And they had nowhere to turn. So when this young rabbi called Jesus told them that they could lay their burdens down, they were listening. The radar was up. They were ready for that. Jesus' words were an invitation. His words were these, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. See, this was an invitation to Jesus himself to know him and to lean on him. Now, this gracious invitation is extended to everyone, everyone who has ever been born to us and everyone who ever will be born. He tells them and us that we don't need to follow laws to earn favor with God. Yes, we have to follow the laws. I'm not saying that we should go lawless. Nobody go out and disobey anything just because of this. But I'm talking about church laws here, right? These man-made laws that that church had will not save them. Those who cannot follow all those laws are no better or no worse than the ones who can so if anyone is trying to earn bonus points for God's favor, stop. You can stop that right now. Because God will never love you any more than he does right now. And there's nothing you could do to make him love you less than he does right now. See, God knows that we have a sin nature. He created us. Right? And, and, and he knows that we require a daily dose of his grace and his forgiveness. And all we have to do is to recognize that fact and accept his gift. I ran across this question in my uh, research this week, and I want to share it with you now. Is heaven full of perfect people, or is heaven full of people saved by God's grace? In fact, heaven is full of people who don't deserve to be there either, but they've been saved by God's grace. And we are saved by God's grace, not by our works. So Jesus follows this invitation to come to him with another compelling statement. The statement is this, I will give you rest. You don't have to worry about being good enough. You can lay that burden down forever and never pick that up again. See, each of us carries a different type of burden. Some of us are dealing with guilty feelings. We feel guilty for the things that we've done. Well, that burden is one that we don't have to carry. We can give it to God. Now, some people think, and I, I just I was, I think this is interesting, think that they are so bad that they are terminally different from anybody else, and that they're so bad that God, even God himself, cannot forgive them. And of course, they're wrong. They're wrong, and God can relieve them of that burden. Some people are weighed down by things that happened many long, uh, many long years ago, perhaps in their childhood, you know, uh, perhaps abuse when they were children. And of course, that is not their fault. These dear people think that if they had been good enough to begin with, that the people who abused them wouldn't have abused them. Right? Those tender souls think that somehow they deserved the abuse. And of course, they're wrong. They're wrong. That is not their burden to bear. So whatever your burden is, no matter how heavy it feels, you don't have to carry it alone. Now, Jesus continues his words with, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, I don't think anybody here grew up in a first century farm in Palestine. I, I didn't think I'd see any hands on it. But we might, and if we haven't, and we haven't, we might not understand the significance of Jesus' statement. You see, a yoke was a heavy wooden harness that rested on the shoulders or the backs of beasts of burden. And what you might not know is that those heavy wooden yokes were custom fit. They were carved to fit the oxen so that each oxen pulled an equal amount of weight with the least amount of strain and effort. Pretty interesting. The 
yoke enabled them to work together as a team, making the work easier for both. So when Jesus invites us to take on his yoke, it's intended to remind us of two things. First, he is offering to help us do this thing called life, and that he will always do his part, and our burdens will be lighter because of them. Secondly, he wants to remind us that he is present with us. All we have to do is turn to him. He is as close as our next breath. So we are yoked with Jesus. Jesus who invites us into a relationship with him. So how do we go about laying our burdens on Jesus? Well, we pray. We pray. Sometimes it requires frequent prayer, and if you'll notice in the Bible, many places it tells us to pray constantly, continually, frequently, right? Anybody ever have a worry that, that, that you lay it down and you walk away, and gosh, 10 minutes later it has snuck back up and it's in your head and it's doing its dance, right? I mean, that happens quite frequently. I know it happens to me all the time. Sometimes those worries sneak back, right, into our heart and our mind, and that's why we have to pray frequently. That's why we have to pray often, because we know that prayer changes everything. Our words when we pray don't have to be fancy or flowery. They just need to be sincere and from the heart, knowing that Jesus is there to help. We don't need to carry those burdens, those things that happened decades ago, or the ones that we hold on to because of our sins. We're a people saved by grace, and once we place our troubles on the tree, and I'm not talking about the trouble tree, I'm talking about that tree is right behind me. The tree on which Christ died for us. Once we hang our troubles on that tree, we never need to take them back again. We never need to pick them up again. The thing is, we need to trust him. So let's hang our troubles on the Jesus tree. Let's not take them back again because prayer changes Caught you off guard there, but you did great. <laughs> Prayer changes everything. Let's pray together. Oh, dearest Jesus. It's so hard for us with all the burdens that we bear in our busy little world to remember to let them go, to remember to release them to you, to remember that you are yoked with us. We are yoked with you. You are as close as our next breath. Let us not forget to leave our burdens in your care. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to uh, bring our attention to the offering. We have a plate here, and that's right in the center door. If you've placed your gifts there, we thank you so much. Again, we always appreciate your uh, stewardship and your faithfulness as you as you help us to continue to do here what we love to do and to continue to serve the community. I'd like to say a prayer over the gifts that uh, we have received and uh, over those that we have yet to receive. Let us pray. God, the giver of all good gifts, guide us to open-handed generosity with our time, our talents, and our tithes. Remember that Jesus gave his all for us. So let's bless these gifts. Give us the wisdom to use them to bless others. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen. One of the really great traditions here at the Awakening Service is that every week we share in communion together. Uh, if you are present with us in the sanctuary, okay, uh, you can always <laughs> you can always pick up a communion cup at the back of the church. It's out in our thanks. If you do not have, uh, I should say, if you're at home, please celebrate with us. Please have your elements handy, and, and we, will, we will take this communion meal together. One of the things that Jesus said to his disciples is that I leave you peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives peace. But if you think about the time just before Jesus died on the cross, that was not a time of peace. That was not a time of peace for his disciples. It was not a time of peace for the people who lived in the 
region. It was a tumultuous, difficult, uncertain time. And, and, and people, they, they, they didn't know which way to turn. Even the disciples who'd spent three years walking and eating and, and just in the company of Jesus Christ, they didn't know where to turn. So even though Jesus gave them peace, they didn't sense that peace because it wasn't peace as the world would give it to them. So let's reflect before too long we'll be celebrating Christmas, but we're not there yet. But, but think about the night that Jesus was born. And, and right away we think of those Christmas cards that we always receive, right? And, and they've perhaps got the little manger there with a star up in the sky and just a silhouette of, of Mary and Joseph and, and the cradle, or I should say the manger, and, and the animals and, and you know angels and, and all of that. We see all that in silhouette. And, and that's, a, that's a, an image that offers peace. Think about the quiet of the desert. Think about just how peaceful and beautiful that was. That was peace. But the real peace, the real peace that Jesus had to offer came at his death, even though it didn't appear to be peaceful. That was the peace he offered because the peace he offered has to do with forgiving our sins. We don't have to worry about those sins anymore because Jesus can give us that kind of peace. Let us uh, share in that peace right now as we remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ who died to save us. Let us take this communion now. given for each and every one of us. And may his peace be with each of us. We'll now enter into the Lord's Prayer. This is the prayer that uh, Jesus told them when his disciples asked, how do you want us to pray? How should we pray? And these are his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the Lord is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Let us share together in the benediction as we prepare to leave this place, uh, but don't leave yet because we've got a closing song we want to, to sing with you. Let's uh, share the benediction. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage and hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people because all people are God's people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's have the members of the band gather up front. We have everyone uh, stand, please. Has everybody seen them?
blessed week, everybody.